18, sorry, 18. Ms. Anderton will introduce uh, the report concerning our consultation response to Tubbridge Wells, please. Thank you, Chairman, and, and good evening, councillors. Tunbridge Wells Borough Council is preparing a new comprehensive local plan to cover the period 2013 to 2033. Like our own emerging new local plan, they plan to prepare a comprehensive local plan. So that will include strategic policies, site allocations and development management policies. Their plan making is at an early stage and their evidence base isn't yet complete. They are undertaking an er this first stage of consultation and have produced an issues and options consultation document. So that would be, that's a regulation 18 um, level of consultation. And that document has been included in your papers in Appendix B. The document doesn't provide a firm position on many policy aspects. Um, and is, is very much focusing much more on issues rather than options at this stage, although they do set out five potential options for the distribution of development, but don't set a preference for one particular option or other at this stage. But significantly, I think for ourselves, the document does start to highlight that Tunbridge Wells Borough may face difficulties in meeting their development needs within their own borough boundaries because they face extensive constraints. Um, it's considered important that this council does make a response at, at this level of, uh, at this stage in, in the Tunbridge Wells' plan preparation um, for three particular reasons. Um, we have a, uh, as, as you're fully aware, we have a, a duty, a duty to cooperate with our neighbours concerning strategic planning matters and to engage positively to help the effectiveness of local plan preparation. And so there's an onus on us really to uh, give our views at this stage as a neighbouring authority. The second reason is that um, after this issues and options consultation, the next consultation stage, Tunbridge Wells Borough Council are planning, is effectively a full draft local plan at Regulation 19 stage. So that's effectively a full draft plan, which following the consultation, the, the Borough Council's expectation will that they will submit that plan to, to examination. So this is really um, a key stage for us to be able to Set, set our views out before um, the plan is crystallized into quite an advanced stage. If it is the case that Tunbridge Wells can't meet their needs uh, within their own borough boundaries, and as I've said, they are starting to signal this in this consultation document, um, it is likely or at least possible that they will be approaching ourselves uh, to requesting if we can accommodate part of their development needs. And so for that reason, and that's the third reason why I think it's important that we set out our stall in terms of an initial position from ourselves um, about the factors we think they should be considering as they continue to prepare their plan. Um, the proposed response is set out in the appendix to your papers. Um, it's obviously set out there for you to read, but key points just to highlight are um, that we're suggesting we should say that it's not sufficient that they meet their local needs. Um, they use that phrase of meeting local needs in a couple of places in the consultation document. Um, our suggested response effectively takes them back to what the MPPF says and says that their starting point should be that they aim to meet their needs in full within their own borough boundaries. Um, as I've mentioned, they're, they're still, at the, uh, still in the process of gathering evidence, and our response also perhaps seeks to remind them that um, it is important that not only they identify constraints, but they also work positively to try and find ways to overcome them, just as we did as we were pre been preparing our new local plan, and that the plan being positively prepared is one of the tests of soundness that they will have to meet. Um, and the third key point made in our proposed response is that um, 
um, and we've referred back to their own evidence and indeed our evidence that we prepared for our local plan, that the actual strongest functional links that Tunbridge Wells Borough has is much more with its West Kent neighbours, so particularly Seven Oaks and Tunbridge and Morling, and in housing terms, a strong sort of ha uh, some degree of housing market area links with um, areas to the south in East Sussex as well. And it's those authorities we're suggesting in our response that um, they should approach first, should be the first port of call in the event that they find they can't meet their needs in their own borough. It should be those, those authorities with the functional links that they should approach first in terms of approaches to, uh, to help them meet their needs. Should an approach be made to ourselves later, later down the line, it's these points um, that we would need to consider in deciding how to respond to such an approach, as well as considering what our own position is in terms of our, our land supply and where we are in terms of the plan preparation process. Um, the consultation on the issues and options document actually closed yesterday. So uh, in order to ensure we did make a response, we've submitted, we have submitted um, the response that you've got in your papers as an officer level response at this stage. Um, but with the agreement of, of Tubridge Wells Borough Council officers that that would be updated with the outcome of the committee's decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's very clear. Councillor English. Um, two things. First, I note the uh, comments in the report about the main transport link between, as far as I'm concerned, but between Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells, which is the railway line to Paddock Wood. I think that uh, it is important for, for a number of reasons, not just responding to this consultation as much as possible is done to improve that railway line and if we well, can work with Tunbridge Wells to, do, to achieve that, that is a, would be a very good thing. So um, point, that point. The second point is more, more of a question and statement. Um, I assume that somewhere in their document for a local plan they are talking about economic development and I, I don't see, maybe I've missed it, I probably have, you didn't mention anyway in your comments anything about economic development. Um, I'm aware that uh, at, um, in relation to some of the, shall we say, not so lucrative employment, uh, which nevertheless is, is, is useful for some people in the borough of Mason, there is a degree of commuting to places in Paddock Wood uh, for fruit packing, various places such as that. Um, had a very unpleasant summer job there myself once, which I don't go into the worst job I ever did, but I had to commute with some difficulty to Paddlewood. So there is some, but there are, was a, as is a significant number of people from the Maidstone area who do go to that area to work. Um, and the report seemed to somewhat underplay that. I admit that that is often seasonal employment and low paid employment and may well not be picked up um, in the same way some other uses are but it does exist and it's advisable to try and make sure those people can use public transport rather than having to drive long, large distances to do so. Thank you Councillor English. Does anybody else wish to comment at this stage? Councillor Mrs Prendergast. I seem to be reinforcing what Councillor English is saying today but my ward which also abuts Tunbridge Wells, a third of our children go to school in Tunbridge Wells, and these are points that are worth remembering, that we have people commuting to work, commuting to school, and we just need to keep a really close eye on, on what they're proposing as we go forward. I think that's absolutely the byword, keep a, a very close eye. Councillor Willis. Um, perhaps it may be worth pointing out that, that um, Staples and Headcorn stations are in the borough of Maidstone, but lots of people travel from the Tunbridge Wells side to those stations. So in any plans to upgrade those stations, and I think Staplehurst, there is a plan for Staplehurst, we'd like them to reference that in their document yeah, to, to get Section 106 funding and things like that. Are we not overplaying this commuting flow potentially to our detriment? I think it affects our congestion, doesn't it? You know, we, we have a congestion issue and I think it affects it 
uh, on our road, our roads, most of the roads to, to, between our major centres aren't particularly wide. They're not going to be, there's no plan for cases to make them wider. So it's important we point out to others when commuting affects us. I think it's important we point out to our neighbouring boroughs that you've got to look at the commuting effect to get to railway stations. Cannon Street line they're on as well, which is why people go there. How, how can I phrase this carefully? But, yeah, you know, it, it wouldn't be a good reason that, to think that we could actually take additional housing to support that population need that needs those transport links. You know, and I think those... <laughs> Though those links that you refer to are more than at capacity at this time. You know, you try getting a seat on those trains. Um, no, look in the other direction. I, I think what Councillor Willis was trying to indicate is that in relation to the, to the transport section of the Tunbridge Wells local plan, it does need to be joined up and that they're not looking just to transport to their borough boundary. In reference to section 106, because Section 106 is formulated from people's local plans. So therefore, if those stations need Section 106 money, we would like to get it from both ways rather than just the Maidstone side. Albeit, I'm sure we'll be into a SIL solution, perhaps. Or SIL then, yeah. Councillor de Wigan then. Um, I think briefly I'd like to say I, I, um, I do like this letter. I think it actually sets out our stall pretty well for... for um, where we would be. Um, I think it's a, obviously a, a perfectly reasonable and obvious gamut of them to start by saying we have lots of constraints. Of course, we had lots of discussions here around that as well. Um, but, of course, they, they, they do have, they do have a significant areas which, which is not hugely protected, and we should be pushing them to make sure they deal with that properly. And, of course, the, the, the very correct statement is, is the... The, the, the housing area, for the housing markets for there are very much um, Tunbridge, um, Tunbridge and Tunbridge Wells together um, rather, than, rather than here. So I think, I think this sets out our store very well. I uh, thank officers for that. And I think um, if we, if we, when, we get into, when we get into any discussion like this, I think this takes us forward very well. That's almost tantamount to you moving the recommendation on the paper, is it? I might as well go and do that then. Yes. Seconded by Councillor English. Um, before I take that to the vote, which I'll do very briefly, I think it's right to just make ourselves aware of something in the background. I do not believe it to be a problem. But, of course, Mid-Kent Legal Services are advising both authorities. And I have the assurance that the officers are effectively compartmentalised in these matters. But I think that we should be cognizant of that in our future thinking. At that moment, I'll move to the vote. Those in favour of the recommendation. And I believe that to be unanimous. Thank you, members. Now we can move to agenda item 19. And Mr Hayes is to present. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Um, we're here today to ask for approval to go out to consultation on the proposed low emission strategy and action plan, as well as a revision to the air quality management area for Maidstone. The low emission strategy will replace and update the current air quality action plan, which was approved in 2008. DEFRA guidance now indicates that plans should be updated and reviewed approximately every five years. It's also a good practice to review the boundary of the air quality management area periodically, with the current air quality management area also being declared in 2008. The documents presented as the Low Emission Strategy and Action Plan have been put together by a councillor-led working group, assisted by specialist officers from across MBC and involving a wide variety of external stakeholders. There are a total of 28 actions in the action plan divided into the themes of transport, planning, property and procurement and public health. Some actions are short term while others have medium and long term delivery time. Almost all of the actions will need the participation of external stakeholders, most importantly KCC and bus operators if they are to be successful. 
Most of the actions can be delivered using existing resources. However, some have either a high financial cost or other high risk factors which will need to be further investigated and presented to the committee individually so that an informed decision can be made on whether to implement them or not. These have been identified in the action plan. The changes to the air quality management area are proposed based upon recent modelling of where air quality is, is genuinely poor. The proposed change will enable MBC to target our actions in the worst effective areas. We will continue to monitor air quality across Maidstone and can review the area again if the data suggests that we should. The Environmental Protection Team will continue to be consulted on any large planning application that might affect the wider air quality either inside or outside the new air quality management area as we are already with the existing air quality management area. The revision will also remove the unnecessary cost of doing air quality assessments on small developments where the modelling shows us that air quality is not bad. In terms of consultation, um, we will consult all councillors and parishes individually as well as special interest groups and identified external stakeholders. There are also several statutory consultees who will be contacted individually. We will also consult the wider public using focus groups, the Council's website, social media, the Next Door Forum, residents' newsletter, and a consultation day in Jubilee Square. The consultation is planned to run from the 3rd of July to the beginning of September, with the results being collated and reported to Environmental Protection by the end of October. We will then be able to bring them back to the committee as a final, a final document, for, hopefully for approval. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. It's very clear. I think Councillor Willis was first, unless that's a leftover. Okay. As to electric vans in the, as a recommendation. So we talk about council-owned vehicles. Uh, we mentioned cars. And we, as you remember, we have brought a, a manufacturer in to look at things. Uh, the, the vans that we use, uh, obviously, we don't want to replace things for the sake of it, but the vans we use could be electric. Is, I couldn't find that referred to in the, in the policy. If I'm wrong, apologies. But. If I might add to that, I think the wording is vehicle, so it's all encapsulating. And actually, this council, some years back, did undertake a trial of an electric van, um, which I believe it proved impractical because of the short range at this time. Um, so it's not an area that we've ignored previously. It can be a desire, as the technology improves, to have, as you know about electric. I think there's, uh, I'd be surprised, but the range that's in, is improving all the time. Let's just say that much. I think it should be a desire, and we try and do it as soon as we can without costing the council any money. Don't think any of us would disagree with that. Mr Hayes? So on... Um page 186 um, we have an action to minimize emissions from the MBC fleet which would be led by the waste and street scene um, section who operate all of our electric all of our vehicles um, they will continue to um, trial further um, use of electric vehicles um, particularly for areas where there are town center focused units and supervisor vans um, as, as you say, as the technology improves, the scope to use alternative fuel vehicles, even for larger vehicles, may well, may well expand. I mean, um, you, know, you never know, you might find a dust cart running on electric one day, but I think we're a little way from that at the moment. Can I ask one further question? It's not a comeback. How do you feel the scheme to... Uh, someone correct me on the name of the scheme, but the scheme where we get money, we've worked with Tunbridge and Morning on this, to get money to retrofit buses, uh, the dirtier buses, and get grants to fit, fit those buses. How do you feel that's working? Because uh, I think I've heard some news from the bus industry that they're concerned about it. But it, it uh, is that moving forward? And is, that's a recommendation in here. Do you feel confident that we can deliver, we can work with a, to encourage our part, transport stakeholders to, to, to do that? Or, or is it something that needs more work? It is something that will always need more work um, in terms of encouraging the bus operators to willingly um, upgrade their fleet because 
even if we can give them funding or secure them funding to upgrade the older buses to retrofit them, there is an ongoing maintenance and operating cost, which is um, something that they, they're going to have to take on. The, the grant funding doesn't give them ongoing funding. It is a one-off. Um, the technology itself is proven. There are hundreds and hundreds of these buses running around London already. Um, but we have um, commitment from KCC for four buses which will run in Tunbridge and Morley and Maidstone um, and been contacted by New Venture recently to say that they have already bought two double, new, new to them double deck buses which have already been retrofitted um, up to the standard that we're aiming for and an email this evening during this committee asking um, if there's still money to retrofit buses although he's thinking about somewhere in Tunbridge Wells that he might use it so it's not going to quite work for us but the momentum seems to be gathering pace so we're um, quietly optimistic. You say that we have this money we've got someone has taken up you said that some of that has been taken up and applied for by a bus operator already doesn't matter the name of the bus operator but So yeah, we are in um, contact with the, oh, is it public transport manager? the public transport manager of KCC um, and with a new route that was let, um, I think it's called the X2, X1, X1 route runs from Kings Hill through to Maidstone. Um, there was a requirement in the tendering process that the successful bidder make those buses available to us for retrofitting. So those are... And that, um, that manager from KCC is running the procurement of, that, um, of the kit for us because he has better contacts in the industry to be able to do that. And then we pay for it. Okay, if I could remind members that we're looking at the document in the context of whether it should go to consultation rather than drilling down into current work on individual aspects. Councillor English. Right. I, obviously, we do need to move forward to consultation on a document. I think it should be this document, largely. Uh, I would like to thank those members who have been involved, and officers who have been, a, a lot of officers who have been involved in the discussions on this. Um, I think we've come to a reasonable set of you know, policies, con suggestions that can be consulted on. The only thing I'm just a little baffled, I'm looking at page 187 on the actual report, I think it may have got a little scrambled on the reference here to electric vehicles. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me reading it. I, know, I, know, I think I know the actual document, the comment in a consultation document is fine, but if you look at the supporting uh, document um, action plan on page 187 under um, fourth column across, it, it's got a bit scrambled, I think. It doesn't really make sense. Um, what I think it, I don't think we were looking at a potential income stream in parking from the provision of electrical points in themselves. I think we were, we've, there was a long discussion about whether or not the committee could actually, uh, um, this committee could in due course look at charging more for polluting vehicles that were not electrical. Um, which, isn't pick, um, which is not something that's picked up in this consultation document at the moment. But I don't think we were looking at making a, a, char a charge for providing uh, the electric points as such because we were actually trying to encourage people to use them. That was the point. And if you, put, if you start charging large sums of money for that, um, other than to cover the costs, um, which is not really an income stream, covering costs, um, it, it, it's a disincentive, so we weren't looking at it that way. We were actually looking in the working group of, of providing those po points uh, as lo low a cost as possible to the council and actually trying to see if we could charge more polluting vehicles rather than the electric ones. So, so I, I'm not at all sure what, that that's what we – well, I'm sure that isn't what we actually said. But the rest of the action plan is totally accurate, and congratulations. Well, I do think we need to clarify that because leaving aside what I just said, it doesn't make any sense when you read it. It's very hard to understand what it means. If I could, since you've picked it up, Councillor English, so on that page 187, 
indications that in town area is not currently a shortage. I don't think that's correct. I, I can check with um, Jeff Kitson, the parking manager, but I, my recollection is that when we spoke to him about that, his view was that the town centre um, electric points are not overused. But I will I'll go back and... Uh, whether or not they're being used or not, um, for whatever reason, and we're committed, the working group has some quite a long list of reasons why they weren't being used, is entirely different point as to whether there are sufficient of them. And, and it was clear that, rightly or wrongly, the working group did not share Mr Kitson's view on that point. And quite frankly, there aren't any in the town. And, and if you recollect, I did actually give you a list of the points that should exist that don't. Mill Street, Moat Park, Maidstone House. You know, there are points that <laughs> are not operational. The nearest ones being County Hall, fully occupied by zip cars. The next nearest being KCC um, site in Aylesford, not open to the public. In, in, in the immediate vicinity, there is virtually no resource, and I believe we were actually looking into the follow-up. So, uh, I, we, we should modify this part of the yeah. report before it goes to consultation. Yes. It's the it's only part of the report that needs it, but that whole paragraph needs taken out and rewriting. So. <laughs> we were there. We were there with you for some of that love. Remember at umpteen meetings. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. So, committee, I, I, I think I'll come to you in a second, Councillor. But I think we're moving to saying yes. Let's get on to consultation. Um, but I think we'd be content for the officer to to modify that um, paragraph at his own discretion. Councillor Wilby. Um, yes, just a quick question about um, 187, the improved bicycle. Um, it runs over onto the page onto 188. It refers to the top of Gable Hill, uh, not covered, could dedicate parking spaces for bikes, but this could cost 2,000 per annum. Um, is that the correct cost? Because obviously I could see a bike ring with a, some concrete and 2,000 pounds per annum to maintain a piece of metal. So I think that again, I just need to change the formatting a little bit. Um, what it means is, is that the bike provision at the top of Gabriel's Hill isn't covered to provide dedicated parking spaces within the car parks that are covered would cost a parking space which equates to £2,000 per annum. I can, I can sort that out as well. Sorry, and just the other thing was, on the taxi ranks, I know I should have probably gone to the work group, I do apologise. Um, about there not being a big uptake, would it be an idea to maybe put charging points in the taxi ranks so people, the taxis could charge their taxis while they're there? May, may I recommend that is if this was the consultation, that perhaps could be a consultation response from you for us to then further consider? Okay. Um, do you need a final word, Councillor English? I, I'm, I'm happy with the recommendations on the papers as they stand. I just wondered how, how we would, this is a separate point really. Um, the working group's been very successful, um, uh, I, I feel, feel well, I think the major, major contribution in many ways has come from Councillor Burton, but, I, but all joking aside, um, I think that all member councillors, including both Burton Councillor David and, and Matt Burton, myself, Councillor Prendergast has contributed, although not technically a member, um, have, have had an input. I, I just wondered how we were going to take that forward, because the consultation process and the committee decisions are one thing, but there is an argument for saying that this is an ongoing issue, and I would like, not necessarily tonight, because clearly it's not on the agenda for consideration, but I would like consideration at some point as to where the, where, whether we need to continue that process for at least uh, a, few, uh, a few months to... Um, to, as, the, as the consultation process and, and developments 
kind to her for talking about other cases and various things, whether we need to actually carry that forward and, and in what format. So can we put that on the work a program for consideration at the next meeting? Uh, am I understanding that so that the working group continue to make a contribution, which yes, seems I, sensible to me. Yes, I think there is me. an argument for that. Yeah. But I, yes, well, it I, wasn't on the agenda this no. evening. I don't want to table it now. I mean, I, I think there, was, there were no terms of reference that constricted that group. So there's no reason why that group could not be involved in reviewing the consultation responses mm. prior to it coming to yes. the appropriate meeting. So, right, if the committee is okay with that, yeah. we could resolve that now. I was just so trying to. As, not as the chairman it. of that group, perhaps we leave that to you to, to call that meeting appropriately, and we're noting the minutes that, that that's the intention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's very satisfactory. Um, so I think but he's a member of that we're group. ready to uh, um, deal with this item. Um, and the final thought is that there's lots of major aspirations in here, and actually post-consultation, the implementation of this will require a lot of detailed policy interventions in all aspects of the Council. But from the Chair then, if I may uh, move the recommendations as per the papers with an addition on one that says subject to the officer modifying Appendix 1 as discussed. But other than that, per the papers, I move that from the Chair. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor English. Those in favour? Thank you. That's unanimous. Very good. Last but not least, um, our added item to the agenda, agenda item 20. Um, this is an update on five year housing land supply. And I'll ask Mr. Watson. Thank you for your patience, but over to you. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, members. Uh, this report is for noting, and it provides members with an update on the Council's five- and 20-year house and land supply position at the 1st of April 2017. The Council's five-year house and land supply calculation was produced using a methodology endorsed by the local plan inspector during the examination of the local plan. The inspector issued a report on his interim findings from the examination of the local plan on the 22nd of December 2016 in addition to confirm that it is reasonable to apply a 5% rather than a 20% buffer to the borough's five-year house and land supply, the inspector recommended two further key changes. Firstly, the inspector did not consider the 5% market signals uplift set out in the strategic housing market assessment would have the desired effect of boosting housing supply, nor that it was justified given the overall increase in past building rates that is expected as a result of the local plan allocations. Consequently, the borough's objectively assessed housing need is proposed to be reduced by 900 units to 17,660 dwellings. The house and land supply calculations are therefore based on this change. The second recommendation by the inspector requires the use of a Maystone hybrid method for the calculation of the, by, of the borough's five-year house and land supply, which would deliver past undersupply as at 1st of April 2016 over a 10-year period to the 31st of March 2026. And this recommendation would result in a smoother and more realistic rate of delivery of dwellings over the local plan period. Okay, headlines of the uh, Council's house and land supply include, as a result of the local plan inspector's interim findings and the continual monitoring of the house and land supply, the Council at the 1st of April 2017 can demonstrate 6.3 years worth of deliverable housing sites against the local plan housing target of 17,660 dwellings. Further, the 20-year supply position has also improved to now having a surplus of 246 dwellings. During the last monitoring year, there was 1,145 dwellings completed, bringing the total completed dwellings for the local plan period to 4,005 dwellings, and demonstrates that the council has made good progress towards meeting its housing supply. Sites that were allocated within the local plan have accounted for 41% of total completions for the last monitoring year. And also of note, completions from permitted office to residential development under prior notification schemes have accounted for 21% of total completions. Small sites continue to make a positive contribution to the housing and land supply and the local economy. There were 100 small sites delivering 130 dwellings during the last monitoring year and have made a contribution of 11% of all completed dwellings during that year.
And so at the 1st of April 2017, we have monitored 1,458 dwellings which are currently under construction, and this gives a good indication that further progress should be made during the next monitoring year on dwellings being completed. In conclusion, as a result of the local plan's interim findings, progress of the windfall gains, progress of local plan allocated sites, and the methodology endorsed by the local plan inspector, the five and 20 year house and land supply positions have considerably improved on the previous monitoring year. Members are asked to note this report. Thank you again for a very clear report. Councillor Mumford. Having lived on the planning committee without a five-year housing land supply, I'm pleased to see these figures. Um, but my comments relate mainly around 2.8, 2.9 and 2.10 where we're breaking down um, the supply and my concern is about over delivery and I'll try and get through this without talking about windfall <laughs> people that remember that I know some of this period we haven't had a five-year housing land supply but as the period's gone on we've had a five-year housing land supply so our policies have uh, been used um, and near the end of the period, we were looking at substantial weight in our local plan, so the policies within there. Now, what concerns me is the figures, uh, there's a contribution of 41% from the local plan. And we know that that, in other years, as we go forward, will produce 17,660 houses. That's only 41% of what has been done this year. There's another 59%. And where is that 59%? Uh, we know where the 41% is. It's in the urban area, the rural service station <laughs> centers and uh, the larger villages. But this other 59%, where is it? Do we have weak policies? And when I look through those percentages, I only see I'm sure of 27%. Where's that 27%? Where did that come from? And where is it? I think we possibly be, should, should be looking at this report and analyzing it deeper to find out where things are being built, what policies are being breached. Otherwise, if this was consistent over the 20 year period, we'd be looking at 34,000 houses if it was consistent. So are we going to see in this analysed in more detail? Mr. Watson. It is my intention um, within the next few working days to actually publish an analysis document alongside the five and 20 year house and land supply tables which break down the figures into more detail. I think it's uh, probably not clear enough in this report, but the 41% reported that you're referencing is uh, for completions this year. So 41% of our net completions were on allocated sites. That's across all of our allocations across the whole of the borough on Brownfield and Greenfield. Um, so it's just a point of reference. And in terms of where our supply is coming from, there's still in, in somewhere in the region of about another 6,000 worth of uh, dwellings on allocation still to, to come through the system, if that makes sense, to, to be actually built out. That's not quite what you meant, is it? That's not quite what I meant. 41% um, of those houses came from the local plan, and they came from local plan sites. Where did the other 59% come from? Okay, yes, to give clarification, um, the, the breakdown of the other 59% will be in the analysis document, but it's uh, primarily from windfall sites, uh, sites that weren't allocated. And that is my point. They weren't allocated. They are not part of the local plan. So we are destined, if this was consistent, of an over-delivery of something like 35,000 houses. Can I ask a question, which if I'm sort of onto the right track might help, but in mentioning that 51% or whatever it is from not allocated sites, would that include perhaps broad allocations? So where develop, 
permitted development rights have kicked in on the broad location of the town centre. So anticipated, but not necessarily an allocated site. Is, is there an element of that there? Mr. Jarman is whispering, yes. So, so I think we'll welcome the more detailed breakdown, but it may not be as bad as it seems on face value. Mr. Regerton. and therefore over time it will dilute as an effect. Yes. Uh, uh, just respond to that. Um, I've been avoiding using the word windfall for obvious reasons. Some of the members know why. Um, but this 59%, I'm really worried about it, and I look forward to seeing a complete how we've analysed it. I do realise some will have gone into the countryside because we haven't had a five-year land supply and our policies have not been in place. But I want to see those. I want to see those that are in the urban edge, the rural service centres. But I want to see those that are in places that this council did not intend to allocate housing. And we're talking about a massive proportion of the houses that we put in last year are not in the are not in our local plan. But this indeed is the legacy of when we did not have a local plan at such an advanced stage. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Councillor English had indicated. Well, it's not just that. I mean, there have been changes to permitted development rights, prior notification procedures and so on have, have come forward and there has been a continuing decline in certain parts of Maidstone's economic development uh, um, offer, particularly in certain types of offices. Having said that, whilst it is somewhat reassuring, or somewhat, to see that um, a lot of the, ex the extra units, and they're not all houses, a lot of them are flats or apartments or whatever, coming forward uh, are in those broad locations. Nevertheless, it would be a problem if, like in in a number of years in our previous local plans we did consistently over provide because over provision can for a start lift the floor which you have to provide in the next local plan because of, his, of the way that these things are treated and B does mean that those units that you've built now aren't available for said next local plan so we have to be careful in any review that, that we don't and monitoring, monitoring and review that we take forward in 2021 or whatever, that we, that we are on top of this direction of travel and the trajectory of delivery. Having said that, there are some things that might impact on housing land supply in a negative sense if, if, we, if certain events uh, in terms of some interest in inspectors' decisions and court decisions impact. So having said that, that, you know, that could be an interesting issue. So uh, um, we, I think that the, 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 what Council Mumford uh, and everyone is saying really is that we need to be on top of managing this process so that if we are undershooting or overshooting, we actually amend our approach insofar as we can and we have this review going to 20, in 2021. Um, to, to ensure that we are actually are meeting our need, or slightly more than that perhaps, but we are not massively shooting ourselves in both feet with a massive plunderbuss so, so, and um, sealing off options for the future, which we have on occasion done in the past. Mr Jarman. Um, 
you. Um, as you said, um, Chairman, um, to my mind, the national policy um, uh, framework was a game changer for the first time that that basic, one of the many things it said was that um, individual um, local planning authorities had to assess their own objectively assessed need. Um, previously, for, for a relatively short period of time, it was done through regional plans. Before that, in Kent, it was done through the Kent County Structure Plan. So um, I can't remember the, the first um, objectively assessed need. I think it was about nearly 19,000. So we were faced with um, the need for 19,000 houses and clearly um, we were hit with a double whammy of having to provide, as Councillor Munford said, a five-year land supply. As you said, a triple whammy. We had a local plan which was published in the year 2000. Um, most of the work was actually approved in, in 1999. Um, so we had to make difficult decisions because obviously local plans take some time, uh, as we all know. Um, and I can think of one uh, development, um, which you know very well, Chairman, um, the map depot, as I call in Morden, where, rightly or wrongly, in one of our first iterations of the local plan, we said something like, in straightforward terms, um, Marden can take more housing. It's in a relatively good location. Um, the map depot, that is, it's a brownfield site. Um, yeah, Marden's um, a sustainable settlement. House builders obviously don't hang around they put in a planning application and in one of our first iterations of the local plan, we decided not to include it as an allocated site because roughly about that time, planning committee had granted planning permission. So I, it, I think there's a lot of sites on the edge of Maidstone, on the edge of villages, where there was a catch-up period. The alternative would have been to pull up the drawbridge and we, we were nowhere near a five-year land supply. I, I wouldn't, I, I can, I think I can see where you're going, uh, Councillor Munford. I can think of um, appeal decisions um, in um, the Warm Lake area where, rightly or wrongly, inspectors have said, I don't think there's massive damage to the open countryside and closely followed by, you have not got a five-year land supply. And I, I don't want to wield a stick, you know, for, you know, about three months of my life. I've got developers on your side saying to me, don't talk about oversupply. You're nowhere near your 17,000. So I think it's, you know, rightly or wrongly, the government is saying these are minimum numbers. Economies can change. Oh, the silence. Sorry. Yes, uh, I think we're digesting that, you know. Um, it doesn't change the issue, Mr. Chairman, that we need to monitor and adjust if appropriate. We, we do need to monitor it, and I think underneath this, there's another observation that we need where um, appeal decisions, planning inspectors do not appear to be supporting us. And I can think of one site in my own ward well, we had a very clear appeal decision that went against us, went against what was suggested in the interim report um, on our local plan. And I hope that we will be front-footed for once to challenge some of these decisions at the highest level and actually test them. So, I, I, I mean, I think you hear the consensus of support to take that robust stance. You know, it was disappointing in that particular case that I mentioned that it appears we did not follow that through for whatever reasons. But um, I think the committee will support that we'll be watching very carefully to make sure that we do should any of those cases come up again. Um, members, to, to wrap this one up, um, the contents of the report are duly noted. Is that agreed? And we welcome the, the further detailed update that I believe we're going to receive by email. 
Um, thank you, everyone, for what has been quite a, a packed evening of different subjects, different items. Thank you all for your attention and contribution, and uh, I bid you a good evening. The meeting is closed. Thank you. <laughs>